All right. All right, so we're here with my new friend, Larry Rolla. Uh, I came across him on the internet on his podcast telling some interesting stories uh, and mostly about the horse racing and harness racing, which I have a personal affinity to just because it reminds me my dad used to gamble on uh, harness racing when I was young, so I know a lot about it. But your what grabbed me when I saw you was um, your tangency with the really infamous, one of the most infamous criminals of the last half of the 20th century and definitely in urban America, uh, Leroy Nicky Barnes. So you, you made a pretty uh, interesting statement. You said, you know, if Nicky hadn't walked into my life at that time, you know, so t t start us off right there and then tell us that exciting story and then we'll, we'll walk it back from there. All right. It was right around 1975, I believe, 75, 76. I was a I was I owed a lot of money to uh, two two pretty bad guys, and um, I was setting up a lot of races at New York tracks, fixing a lot of races at New York tracks. And um, the fella that um, I had running running this for me, um, we were making a lot of money, and then he just decided he didn't need me anymore uh, after he got all my connections and. And uh, he disappeared. I, I couldn't find him. And um, but that didn't stop the sixteen thousand a week vig I had to pay to uh, a couple of bad guys that were out there that I owed because of uh, my uh, sports betting habit. So uh, the whole world was going to collapse, and um, I, I w without without uh, this fella calling me up and give me that information on what races were fixed, um, I would probably wind up in a, in, in a drum someplace full of cement uh, and dumped into the ocean. That was probably going to be the end result. And I had a few days to try to um, get 16,000 uh, VIG that I, I owed so I could, I could live, I could last another week. I had no idea how, how to do it. And um, a friend of mine called me that day and said, you have to do me a favor. Uh, there's a few friends of mine from the old neighborhood, Harlem, that uh, are up here to, uh, to see. I think it was, uh, um, uh, I forgot her name, this, this, Nat King Cole's daughter, Natalie Cole. Oh, Natalie Cole, yeah. Natalie Cole, she was she was doing her first ever show live performance, and it was going to be at the Raleigh Hotel. So um, he said, and uh, they can't get seats, they can't get rooms, uh, and maybe you can help them because at that time I had racehorses with uh, with uh, Manny Halbert, who owned the Raleigh Hotel, where Natalie was going to perform, and I had horses with. Bobby Parker, who owned the Concord Hotel and Grossinger's, and, and, and Charles Sosky, who owned Monticello Racetrack and the Nevely Hotel. So uh, I made a phone call and uh, I, 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 got them, I got them a room. And, and that's basically how it started. And I met him the following night at the Concord Hotel. I told him that I would be there and, and uh, they wanted to thank me for what I did. And uh, we met, and through conversation, um, they found out that I told them that I was training horses and racing horses, and uh, and one thing led to another, and and uh, he told me, he says, I, I told him, he says, when are you racing? I said, I'm racing a couple tomorrow night. I says, but you you can't come because there's absolutely no handle. And you guys are probably used to betting a lot of money, and uh, there's no handle. So if you bet two hundred on a horse, it'd be three to five, and it'd be not worth your while. And then he said something that was very interesting that basically saved my life. He says, "Well, I could get five thousand a position down off track, and 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 off a uh, position means five thousand win, five thousand plays, five thousand show." So I says, I says, look, in all due respect, um, there ain't a bookmaker in the world going to take a harness track. 
I says, and if, and if you found one, they definitely wouldn't take $5,000. And he said to me, he says, um, he says, we, we bet over a million dollars a week just on, uh, on sports. And this is, is this is Nicky Barnes you're talking to. This is Nicky Barnes. Right. Did you know who he was at this point? Oh, I, I, I knew, I, I knew who he was. I didn't know the other fellows he was with, but I knew who he was. Um, million and and just so people are reminded this is in 1975 so money is about say five times so a million then is five million now that's sixteen thousand a week you had to pay in interest which wasn't paying off your debt that was equivalent to you know sixty thousand now or something yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was a lot of money. It's all relative because, you know, I mean, if you're working in a post office and you're making $10 mm -hmm. an hour or something, but I, uh, the business I was in, you had the ability to, to earn a lot of money through, through betting. So if you, if you, if you know, if you could bet $200 and, and, and win a thousand, which would be what a, a regular guy is probably making in a month. So uh, it, it's all relative, uh, and after a while, it becomes a way of life, and, and it becomes like monopoly money. So it, it don't mean nothing. It, it don't mean as much to, to the average person. But now we're talking about uh, people who are not average. People are doing things that uh, the, the normal people don't do. So anyway, uh, <laughs> he said that uh, he said that uh, he can get down five thousand position. And he said he can get it down with, with because I asked him, I said, who's going to take this kind of action? And he says he, we bet over a million dollars a week with Fat Tony, which is... Uh, Tony Salerno. He went yeah. down on the Mafia Commission case. So right. he was known, because I know even he had the, the Cuban contact with Frank Matthews, Spanish Raymond, who was a big numbers bank uptown. He was, Fat Tony was behind him. So at the top of the gambling food chain, the only people they could back and pay off those kind of bets were the biggest mobsters, right? Yeah. And then also they were the only people who other high-level people would be scared to not pay. Exactly. Because Nicky Burns ain't going to just pay anybody if you don't have to. Right. So um, so now in, in order to do that, and, and you're right, he was, he was hooked up um, – he, he was hooked up pretty good with the Italian crew and uh, he did bet a lot of money and, um, and we wind up winning a lot of money. Uh, mm -hmm. How, how we did it uh, is another interesting story. If you want to get into that, because I was fixing races and how, how, how we were getting all the money fixing races. And I'll just give you a, a layman's example. Uh, say these eight horses in a race, I would pay four of the jockeys or drivers to be worse than third and then, and then box the other four and exactors or trifectas or superfectors. So you're so, paying people to stay out of the top three. Stay out, yeah. Stay out of the top three. Don't be first or second. And, uh, and that's how I was doing it. But now when Nikki Barnes come with this, with this great opportunity, um, it was a little different because I couldn't pay seven guys to stay out of the race. I couldn't. So I had to just make sure that one horse won. And how I did that was basically by myself. I would switch horses. I would have, I would have uh, just to give you a real. You mean like a point. horse would run under a different name than he really was. Right. I, I would have, I would have say, uh, I'd have a horse in the $3,000 claimer. And then I would have another horse in my barn that was maybe a $20,000 claimer that looked similar to that horse. Now, when you bring these horses into the paddock, they have an equipment guy. So naturally, by racing up there, I knew the equipment guy well. And I give him $1,000. Uh, and I say, look, you want just when you come to this horse, uh, his tattoo number is going to be different. Just pass him by or just write down what it, what it should be. So it, it and, and and that's another example of that you know if you have everybody has a price so uh, I was able to switch horses and so I'd have now I'd have uh, a twenty thousand dollar claimer and a three thousand dollar claimer and there was no way he he could lose he could fall down and still win so these are the things that I had to do that's just one example but these are the things I had to do to make sure that I would win. And then another thing I did was um, I would um, 
I'd give a couple of friends of mine uh, a few hundred dollars and bet on some other horses in the race. And my friends, they knew they were with me, the people in the grandstand. They would hawk them to the window and then they say, oh, Larry's betting on this horse, which which I was really betting on the other horse. And, and they would make that horse the favorite and the odds of my horse going up. But Tony, Fat Tony Salerno, he paid. He paid track. He paid track odds. And 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 he paid and and uh, and every week I would go down to uh, uh, his garage uh, and and I think his garage was on I think on 145th Street in Lenox. Come on, Nikki's garage. Yeah, Nikki Bond's garage. Uh, it, you'd go down a, a little driveway and then there'd be a guy um, washing the cars there, and Nikki would have his office there, always in there with three or four guys. And I would go down there usually on a Tuesday or Wednesday and pick up eighty thousand, a hundred thousand, whatever, whatever was there. My 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 end of whatever, because the deal was he'd bet five thousand a position, and we would split it. So I would get I'd get like a twenty five hundred dollar bet, and uh, and uh, he he uh, he 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 was he was true to his word. I mean, it was ne never a problem. Uh, the only problem I had in the beginning was I didn't, I didn't know if I could, if I could trust him or not. I, I never had any dealings w w with him. Uh, I knew who he was. Uh, he was a power. What was his reputation? What's that? Did he have a negative or positive reputation or just another gang dangerous? I, gang? I, I wasn't in the drug business, so I, I, I didn't know. I just knew that there were bodies all around the place in Harlem, and uh, he had a crew of guys that were, uh, in fact, <laughs> one of the guys. Um, his name was 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 Leon, Leon Bats, and uh, they called him Scrap. And when I first went down there the first day, uh, it was Leon who handed me my package. And as I was leaving, Nikki pulled up and, and I said, he said, you get your money? And I says, yeah. I says, who is that kid? He was a kid. He's like 20 years old. And uh, I, I said, is he OK? He said, if he wasn't OK, he, he, he wouldn't he wouldn't be with me. He said he said. And then he says, he says that boy who walked through hell with dynamite in his pockets. You don't worry about him. And uh, that's how I met the whole crew. There was another guy there that who was more impressive he impressed me more than nicky bonds his name was robbie i stepney I, robbie his name was i was don't know robert stepney i don't know but i the only guy that knows about him because he was his right hand man was a guy called greeny they called him greeny green because they always everything green green cadillac green clothes and Leon gave me his phone number. He says he would know everything about Robbie. Now, Robbie was extremely I I impressive. I, I, his name is nowhere in sight. I don't know who he is. I know he got round up and went to jail. Same age as Mickey or younger, older? Yeah, no, same age. And when I called Greeny up, because I have his phone number, he wouldn't meet with me because of COVID. When I called him up, he says... He says, forget about Nikki. He says, Robbie was the man. Now, outside of Leon, who just said, yeah, Robbie was a real low, low key guy and everything. Uh, uh, but I, I would love to find out all about and maybe someday I'll call Green on Green, Greeny, they call him. Uh, but um, is that him? Is it? I can't tell it. It, it, it they it. it I can't. I can't say they all. Well, because I think there was a there was a guy, a known guy, Robert Stepney, Robbie, they called him, who was big in the game. It would have been at that level. He had. A, he wasn't as flamboyant as Nicky. Not as famous as a name to the public, but everyone in the street knew who he was. And he kind of mysteriously caught a case, and then he kind of disappeared. I think that must be him. That 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 got to be him. I I can't tell. It was fifty years ago. Yeah. 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 But it's Robert Stepney. I mean, how many Robbie, Robbie uh, heroin kingpins can there be, right? Robbie, Robert Stephanie. Is, I gotta call Stephanie. up Greeny. S T E P N E Y. Stepney. I gotta write that down. S P S S T. 
like step, like take your first step. Okay. M E Y, step me. I got it. Ravi Stephanie. Okay. That has to be him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, they, the, the only thing I remember about all of them was that they were loaded with jewelry and diamond rings and, 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 and all of that kind of stuff. But they were, they, the, when I, I, I used to hang out a little bit down there, but they were a scary bunch of guys. They, they, they were, they were a scary bunch of guys. See, they exuded an aura of violence, potential violence. Yeah, well, you know, you, they would deal from from the little bit that I've seen that when when I was hanging down there, they'd have they have street hustlers come down there, and and when when uh, it was it was Leon that used to walk me through the streets whenever we want to go to a store or something, and it was just a scary it was a scary area. Some maybe it was scary because I wasn't used to it seeing guys, you know, old. Drug well, addict. I mean, that was very high crime. No, I mean, there was a tremendous amount of street crime, and the heroin addicts were pretty concentrated in certain neighborhoods back then, Harlem being one of them. I mean, that was, it wasn't like now where everyone's on drugs everywhere. Like, you know, Harlem was heroin city, and uh, I suppose if you're in a neighborhood that's kind of frightening and these guys are like running it, that by extension, you think, hey, these guys must be dangerous. I mean, let me tell you what happened one day. I went down there to collect. Usually I go down there on Tuesday or Wednesday. And I went down on a Tuesday and, and uh, uh, Leon wasn't there. And uh, Robbie said, uh, I mean, not Robbie, uh, Leon said, uh, come with me. And we got in his car and he drove me to Robbie's house. Now, Robbie, I believe we went to New Jersey. He had a house. In the backyard, he had a, a basketball court. He was playing basketball with his son, and in his in his back at the back of his house, going into the basement. Uh, I guess they made arrangements for me to go there and pick up. It was I think it was one hundred twenty, one hundred thirty thousand. He had he had three fifty five gallon drums full of money in 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 his basement. And and me and, and Robbie, Robbie was playing with his kid basketball, and he just says, Leon, just go get what you need out there. And and we went in the basement and just counted out uh, whatever it was. And that's that was the last time I saw Robbie. But to me, Robbie was an, a very, very impressive guy, more so to me than than Nikki. Now that's as much as I know about Robbie. Uh I, I don't know, but Nikki Bonds was Nikki Bonds. Nikki Bonds was uh You have a big personality? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 uh yeah. Yeah, but I I kinda I But kinda you got a big person. I mean a lot of uh a lot of guys in the that's an interesting thing about uh I've learned with high, a lot of high level criminals are like have kind of a movie starish almost you know, charisma, you know, like that's what keeps you alive. If you didn't have the personality you have, I'm sure you'd have been dead a long time ago. Well, what kept me alive, I believe, knowing knowing the streets was showing up. You got to show up regardless. People got to like you, like just, you know, on some, because there's a lot of borderline decisions where it's like, eh, he's a, we don't like him anyways, kill him or someone probably saved you and says oh no that's he's a good guy he's good for it you know look the streets the streets of Harlem and the Bronx are full of bodies that that didn't show up that uh either dealt in counterfeit money to get drugs or whatever they they took no prisoners I I mean there was you know you 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 had to pay for what you got and uh it was a vicious vicious game and I don't believe that they 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 couldn't and they and they didn't let anybody get away with anything. It was yeah. it's, it's cut and dry. Yeah, if whatever you owed, you had to pay. If you come to get something, you better have the money, and it better be clean money and no counterfeit stuff because you wind up in the street. Uh, I, something I'm interested in people, regular people, having an understanding of is back right in these years you're talking about, or probably the peak of it. Organized crime in general, led by the Italian mafia, but even people like Nikki Barnes, but it all 
lot of it trickled down from the mob. You're talking about the amount of counterfeit money. A real shadow government. Like, I mean, in a city like New York, I mean, your daily life was impacted by the mob. I mean, a regular citizen's daily life was impacted by the mob. And, and uh, you know, Nicky was getting his drugs from the mob. And he was betting with the mob. Like, what was the power of the mafia at that time and someone like fat Tony Salerno. Well, I, be, because of the position I was in and the tremendous earning power I had. And, uh, the fact that I used to go to a nightclub just about every, every night, uh, because the nightclubs back then there was a nightclub on every corner and there was a band in every nightclub. But you love live music. I love live music. That was my first love before anything else. <laughs> so, uh, naturally, what, when when you go into these nightclubs, every nightclub back then was owned by uh, either a, a, a mob a mob boss or a mob guy, and and eventually you meet everybody, which in one way is a blessing because you, there's always a table there for you, and there's hardly ever a check. But then after a while, it gets to the point where they know what you're doing. And everybody wants a piece of the action, and it, and then it gets kind of sticky because you know you know you stop you you, you you've stop been taking eating. favors, you've been taking free food and drink, and you know yeah, and then they say you know I heard you don't go into a place for two or three or four days, and then they say you know I I heard that you had a couple of winners, you you never come to see me, and and uh, I you never get a check, you always get a front table, and you run into that stuff. <laughs> and and I'm going to clubs from from Harlem to 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 uh, the Bronx, Brooklyn, all all over the place. And after a while, uh, I mean, you can't you can't you can't tell everybody everything. And when you don't, they they get a little they get a little nasty sometimes. And that's that's some of the problems I I, I run into. And there's really no escape from that except just just don't go out, but then they come and hunt you down. And it's amazing to me, as much money as Nicky Barnes had, as much money as Robbie had, they still look for an edge. They still have to gamble. They just, you do know, but you're like that too. I mean, not you're not as bad. You weren't selling drugs, but I mean, even you kind of like. Yeah, but I, I, ha I, I had no other option. There was no option for me. I had, that's because you were losing. Yeah, but that's because you were losing what you were making gambling, right? I was making it with the horses and losing it with the sport. So you put yourself in the position of no other option. Ab absolutely. So <laughs> that's a psychological, <laughs> like you like your back against the wall. Yeah, but it, it's it's you know an addiction is an addiction, and yeah. and I mean Charles Barkley, Michael Jordan, Davy, Mo Gladys Knight, a hundred million dollars they lost. Uh, Gladys Knight was a big gambler. Gladys Knight lost over a hundred million dollars. Well, that's that's sad. I didn't know races. that. Oh, Michael wow. Milch, the guy you might know him because he's in the, your business. He uh, he was the guy who wrote the that TV series Luck and uh, and, and a couple of other series. He lost a hundred million dollars betting on horses. Uh, I mean, horses you know, in yeah. the United States. God damn. Yeah, but you don't hear about these people no. because they can afford it's not to And it's not glamorous. The losing side, that's something else. So, you know, we see mob movies. I mean, I think that's why people like Goodfellas so much. You kind of got a glimpse into like, no, these are like low. Like they may have a veneer of glamour and fun personality, but like, you don't have to scratch too far under the surface to find danger, to find low life, like rough, rough guys. To be a made member of the mob, I don't, maybe not now or less so now, but back then, anyone that was a made member of the mafia was a rough guy, right? Well, they, they, they were rough in that, because you, you got to remember. And in the sense that they, you, they definitely could kill you, would kill you. Yeah, well, the, the 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 I'm not talking about the upper echelon, even though all of them wanted an edge too. As much money as they have, if you say I have a horse that I get, like, <laughs> I'll, I'll use John Gotti for for example, because I had a horse with John Gotti, and he was probably the 
one of the biggest betters that 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 I know. He would. He would bet. always lose. They said he always lost. He yeah. He, he bet on he bet on it on on, on anything, and uh, uh, but he could afford it because every week he'd get an envelope. Every day he'd get an envelope, so he he could afford it. <clears throat> but then you get guys in the crew, whether to be associates to to that crew or, or just soldiers. Uh, they're out in the street to try to make money, and, and whether it be extortion or, or whatever it might be, they have to make money. And then when they hear about a guy like me who's dealing with uh, uh, John Gotti and telling him information on fixed races or, or whatever, uh, they, they, they kind of they kinda get to you, and, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's scary because you know that these guys, if you answered them the wrong way, uh, you, you, you got a problem. I could probably name five or six guys that were in the same position as me for a whole lot less money that I never saw anymore because they didn't show up. And, and when they finally, and they always get caught and uh, it's just a, it's just a tough business. But when you get the guys like Michael Jordan or Charles Barkley, they can afford to, to pay. So you don't hear about that. You just see these other guys in the streets and, uh, you got your uh, uh, to go back to the dangerous situation you're in, just so people know. And you, you, oh, Larry, go, go. I'm gonna put a link to Larry's book, and uh, the book opens with this story. It's right around. It's this time period. He's in debt for sports gambling to some Gambinos out of New Jersey, right? And they actually put your feet in cement on a boat. Well, what what happened? I'll tell you real quick what happened. So it makes it kind of makes sense. <laughs> When I was with, uh, when I started this whole gambling thing, uh, I got very, I got addicted and I started losing a lot of money, but it was right around 1971. I was, I was, the addiction was, I, I couldn't control it. Were you trying to get edges on the sports gambling or you just compulsively placed bets? No, I had no way to get an edge. I, I had no way to get an edge. I was just, I was just uh, uh, addicted. So what happened was I was making when I first started fixing the races with Chula, uh, I we were he was honest with me. We made a lot of money and and uh, that went on for about a year, a year and a half. And uh, I lost probably a million to a million and a half dollars in in 1971 alone. That was the first year. 71? In 71. What happened? You see, Very I, I go into people saw a million dollars in 1971. But what happened, what you see, that's what, if I don't tell the whole story, you think it's fake. But here's what happened real quick. In 1971, uh, my good friend, who I became very good friends with, owned Monticello Raceway, Charles Slutsky. And we became good friends. That, how we did it, that's another story. But I told him uh, he had a pool party one day. And he owned the Neverly Hotel and all the racing commissioners and state senators and everything used to go to his hotel because that was a high class ho hotel. It was in Ellenville, uh, about 20 miles from Monticello. And and uh, I told him when he had the pool party, they were they were all in a the room there with m mounds of cocaine and everything. And I stayed with the band. But he called me in and I said, Charles, I don't. He says, have some fun. I says, I don't do that stuff, but I want to talk to you. I says, all these guys here make all the rules and the dates for all the races that, that go on. The racetracks close for three, four weeks during the winter months. Tell them that you want the racing dates for them months, the two weeks before Christmas and a week after New Year's. And your handle will go from $2 million, from 200000 to to three, four, five million plus OTB is, is supposed to open in November of the same year, of that Off year. Track off track betting, I says, and your handle will be astronomical. Make a long story short, that's what he did. I handle started, is the volume of money bet. Right. The po total mutual handle, right. So where prior to that, if you made a $20 bet, the horse would be the favorite. Now with that massive handle, you could bet 2000 and the odds might go up. Because people that's in the whole tri-state or people, anyone in New York City can go into their neighborhood they don't got to go to the racetrack. They right. Can, okay. Right. Okay. So now the handle become astronomical. So I was fixing the races and I had three runners that I sent to OTB in Middletown, Yonkers, all over the place. 
I would fix the races and we would, I, I, every day I'd win a hundred thousand, 200,000, something like that. So now wow. when it came to the sports betting, I was betting 20,000 a game, 10,000 with each guy. So, and I also had a limit of 500 a game on college games, but I was betting a hundred college games, a, 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 you know, oh, a week. So you so at that volume, you couldn't have known. You're just ticking off. Oh, How yeah. You even choosing the winners. You're just, you like the team's colors or something? It was just an addiction. It made no difference. I had no idea what color the Giants were or not. I just wait. It was just an addiction. Oh, you didn't even know who these teams even were half the time. Right. It was, wow. it, I would just start shaking if there was a game that I didn't know and I didn't bet. That's shaking. how bad it was. So really? anyway, let me tell you how I got into the cement. Okay. So now I'm betting with, with uh, Kabert, the guy in New Jersey that later on became one of Gotti's button guys, uh, and uh, this old Jewish mobster, Barney Cutler, who wound up retiring in Monticello. I'm with the two book bookmakers I was betting with. So I, between the both of them, I lost about a million, million and a half dollars. And I paid. Every Tuesday, I paid. So my credit was excellent. But then right around the end of 71, 72, I, I went broke. I had no more money. And, and Tony wasn't calling me on a regular, and I couldn't, I, I, I was broke, but I had an addiction. So I told, I told the bookmakers that I owed Cabert and, and Barney that I was going to, I was going to Florida to buy some property, which was a lie. But I also knew that they would say, don't worry about it. Call me up from Florida. We'll give you the line and you can bet. And then I told them, I says, look, I mean, he may not be back for a week or two. And they said exactly what I knew they would say. Don't worry about it. Because they got a million and a half of my money and it was never already. Yeah. yeah. Plus, I was in the game where they knew I was a big earner. So I went to Florida. I bet the first week I lose 70, 80,000. Next week I lose a hundred and something thousand. The third week I really start chasing. I wind up owing close to $700,000. Now at that point, I had to make a decision, uh, run away, kill myself, or go back and face the music. I never ran away from anything in my life. I went back. You were paying 2.5% a week or something? Well, what happened was I went to Cabert, and uh, who was Gotti's guy. The, the, he was a bad guy. He killed 17 guys. This is all in a newspaper. It's all recorded. He was just a bad guy. So when I come back, I land, he has the guy pick me up and he says, you want to go to your house? Get the, you know, you got to, I said, no, no, no. Take me right to him. I says, I don't have the money. And he says, so anyway, he calls him next morning. I, he brings me down there. He brings me down there. we go going to his little cafe, just like a mob movie. And he just, you walk in the back, he's sitting there with three of his guys with a little demi test. And they walked me out to the pier, and uh, they had a little boat out there, maybe 30-foot boat. They take me out in the ocean. They walk downstairs. After about a half hour, they call me back up, and uh, they tell me, step in. It was like a half a 55-gallon drum, maybe two, three feet high. And I step in the drum. They pour a couple of bags of cement. They start pouring water in, and here, he, and here comes Cabert. And he stands right at my face, and he says, um, Sammy let you go too far. That's on him. You went too far. That's on you. Now you tell me why I shouldn't let this cement harden and throw you the fuck overboard. And I says, cause I could pay. And then he looks at Sammy. He says, you hear what he said? And Sammy stuck up for me. He says, you know, we got a, we got a half a million from him. He paid every week. He's in the game where he could pay. So, so Cabert says, all right, you can pay. Good. I'm going to make this 360 that because I owed each of them 360, 370. Uh, I'm going to make this a Shylock loan. Two points a week, which is 7,200, I think. He says, and uh, every week you come here, you miss one week and uh, you'll be right back here with no turning back. So I went to the other guy, Barney Cutler. I made the same deal. So my payment every week was close to 16,000 a week just in VIG. So that's how that's how that cement story happened. And, and two and a half is actually a a, a, a good deal. I mean, some people are paying five percent, right? Well, it was two two points. Yeah, normally the boss the boss gives out the money and he gives it to his his underlings, his captains, or something for one point. And then when they put it in the street, they give it to their friends or something for two points. 
Uh, and well, when they give it to the their men, they they charge a regular street guy three, four, five, six points. You know, they, get. so they that's how the shot in 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 loan sharking or shy lacking. That's always been one of the lifebloods of organized crime, right? Absolutely. That and bookmaking, yeah. Shylock and, and those go hand in hand. You get into <laughs> debt like you did. You get into debt from yeah. gambling and then you got to take out. Well, you know, even, even the crap games, you go to the, one of their crap games, you broke, you, there's a Shylock right there. You give them, give them money and you, you know, that, that, that was their way of making money. And, and, and if you say a regular Joe, he gets a thousand dollars. So he's got to pay 50 a week. He could pay fifty a week for a whole year, which is twenty five hundred. He's paid back the loan two and a half times, but because he was only making the big every week, he still owes twenty five. Or he still yeah, owes. Well, that, that's exactly right. Well, what happened was after after <clears throat> after three years and after Nikki Bonds and them went to jail, that my earning potential became zero again. So how long I, did you go on with Nikki? Three with Nikki. Oh, Nikki was only a few months. Oh, and he, then they got popped. Then they got popped. The whole crew. Well, so that's probably there. seventy-seven, man. Yeah, yeah. The whole crew got popped, and uh, and and that was that was the end of that. So right yeah. away, I went to a uh, Cabert and Barney, and I and I told them, I says, look, I'm I'm all done. I says now before before a situation happens where I I I can't pay or I miss a week, I've been doing this now for close to three years. I I need to make a deal. Whatever I give you from now on has to come off the top because I can't continue this. And they both agreed and they made the deal with me. And uh, and whatever I gave them on a weekly basis, whether it be 10000 or 500 it, ca it came off the top. And that's how we eventually, uh, that's how I eventually got even by seven, by 78. But it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible, terrible, I never thought, I could never understand how a drug, a druggie couldn't get off of drugs and how a, uh, but when when I got this addiction, um, it, it's a terrible, terrible addic addiction. It's it's tough, and not only that, but from what I understand, um, that all the suicides of all the all the all the addictions, uh, the the only ones that commit suicide are the gamblers, because one because you you wind up with can't nothing. get out of it. Yeah, you can't get you wind up with nothing. And in my case, not only did I wind up with nothing, I owed six hundred thousand. The people that would take your life. The people that would take your life, yeah. Now if, if Nikki Bonds just would have waited another few months before they got paid. Yeah. I would yeah, I I would have been I would have been in good shape. But I, I met with Leon uh, after he got out of jail. He he got I think he got he, he got, got the least amount of time. Yeah, he, he got that council well, that was, was the that was a council case, right? Yeah, yeah. And he was just a young kid, and they really, they, they, they he come around late, and uh, he got, but he got 10 to life. He only wind Which up. Which is a lot of time, I mean. Yeah, but he, he, he wind up, I think, only doing 10 or 12 years. But uh, he, uh, he, he was on, he was on one of my podcasts. I asked him to, I asked him to come on, and, and he did. And, and, and it was something that he did because the night before he got mugged. He got, he got, yeah, that he had that hat on. He had a big lump and he had, he had about 20 something stitches in his back. And they, they, really, about the, oh, you mean before he did your podcast? Where did yeah, he do that? The night before he got, he got mugged. Where, he got, where at? Somewhere in New York. It, in Newark. Damn. Yeah. He's a big guy, too. I wouldn't pick him to mug. Yeah. Well, well. Well, when you're dead, when you're out mugging people, I guess you're at a point of desperation, you know. Yeah, it makes no difference, and and they they loaded up, so they're they're all right. So you reference this guy Tony, so that's a good segue. Let's go back into the horse racing. So uh, you had a lifelong from childhood. You're interested in horses, so you're trying to get established. It's the mid, or no? When did you meet Chula? The early seventies, like seventy three. 71. 71. Okay. So that's when you had your run. So seven, you never really saw any big money in 69 or 70. 71, you're in New England and you meet this guy who's kind of operating under Whitey Bulger's umbrella to a degree. Or tell well, us about what, what, Tony well, Chula. Yeah. Let me give you a one minute backstory on that. Who ended up flipping and going to witness protection, like a lot of them. Yes. Yes. 
Well, let me just give you one minute backup uh, uh, backstory on, on that. When I first got in the horse business, uh, I, b- before I got into the horse business, I was uh, I got I got caught uh, in in a burglary, and uh, I got busted up pretty bad by detectives because I wouldn't tell them who the guy was that I that. And you're I, in your what? Your mid twenties at that point? No, I was uh, eighteen. Oh, I was eighteen years old. And I got busted up pretty good. The, the detective Sands at 114 Precinct, uh, he may try to make me sign a confession. I wouldn't sign it. They busted me up pretty bad. They broke a uh, concussion, uh, one eye socket, uh, two or three ribs, of an ankle, my, my ankle, and uh, busted me up. And then they threw me down in the tombs at 114 Precinct <clears throat> from Friday until Monday. I went to court, and my mother coming to get me. And uh, this was after three or four years of doing similar stuff, but not getting caught. And um, I, I says, Ma, you, you got to get me to the hospital. I'm trouble breathing. And she said, I'm going to take you where I should have taken you two years ago. That's when she took me to Tommy Lucchese. Tommy oh, Lucchese, oh. Uh, it was, she ran all the dress factories for Tommy Lucchese. Legal, legally. Just legally. Legally. Yeah, your, legally. Your mother just happened to be employed as a, her legal job. Right. She was working in the garment industry, she was really good at her job. And Tommy Three Fingers Brown Lucchese, who was the head of Lucchese crime family and controlled the garment district, he picked your mother out of the pool of legal employees and said, you're such a good employee, you're going to be directly under me, right? Very good. And that's exactly what she did. They got along very well. So she takes me to him, and I'm all bloodied up. From my clothes are full of blood. My I got dried blood in my ears, my eyes, everything. And he says to my mother, he says, uh, "Can you leave the room? Let me talk to Malone." And it was very simple what he said. He just says, "I just want you to know, your your mother is a good woman, and she's my friend. And you're breaking her heart with all your nickel and dime bullshit." Now, I want you to go home and think about what I just said. That you're breaking your mother's heart. Now, if you want to straighten your life out, I'll help you in any way that I can. You'll never have a problem, including the one you have right now. And and that's what turned my life around. Now, he when got I, you, so he got you out of that, that burglary case. Oh, yeah. He, he, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. That, that, back in them days, and I'm sure that you know, he controlled the whole city. Everybody was on. He was the head. So people know he was the head. Of the the family is still named that, like it's still the Lucchese family, right? E- exactly. And back then, he controlled everybody because that ev- everything went away. In fact, when when I got my license with the horses, I applied for souls at Roosevelt Raceway, and uh, they denied me because I was somebody brand new. And 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 I told my mother because what happened was when I told when when my mother told Tommy that I straightened my life out. It's been almost a year, and I got my license with the horses. And uh, he gave my mother $20,000 to give to me to buy some horses. Now, I bought the horses, and then I applied for stalls at Roosevelt Raceway. They denied me the stalls. I told my mother, I says, they for wouldn't. What give me for what? No, like, you weren't a known, at that point, you hadn't been in the fixing right. pieces or nothing. Yeah, yeah. And I was brand new in the game. Roosevelt was, uh, Roosevelt and Yonkers was a premier racetrack. And they didn't know who I was. And, and they denied me stalls, which is, which was common. But. I didn't know it was common because I just figured I apply and I get the sauce. So I called up my mother and my mother told Tommy. And, and the next morning, my mother says, go to Roosevelt. There's four stalls. There's four stalls waiting for you. And I bought four horses with Tommy's money. So I says to my mother, how did he do that? And what happened was Roosevelt Raceway was owned by Morton Levy, who was the attorney for Frank Costello and, and Lucchese. And he owned the racetrack. So it was just a phone call that was made and they treated me like a king. And it was a little different story when I got to Yonkers, because when I got to Yonkers, this <clears throat> white collared criminal who owned the racetrack called Marty Tannenbaum, he, I won't go into the story. I'll just tell you that he barred me f- from all the New York tracks for, cause he accused me of stiffing a horse and I really didn't. Now, once I was barred from all the New York tracks, I had no choice but to take these horses and go to all the out-of-town tracks where they race for no money at all. They race the purses and nothing. You starve to death. 
And I asked my mother if Tommy could get me reinstated. But at that time, he was in the hospital with a malignant brain cancerous brain tumor. <clears throat> and, uh, and he couldn't help me. And he wound up dying very soon after that. So now for three years, two, three years, I struggled eating. I was catching pigeons and rats and eat. That's how I was eating. So anyway, when I get to. Oh, so when, when your I, love for horses was so much you were, didn't want to go back to regular life or something else. You wanted to be around horses. You wanted to be in their life. Well, that, that was part of it. The other part of it was Lucchese was still alive. They were really his whole, I mean, he, he's the one that set me on the right track and uh, I didn't want to disappoint him. So I figured, well, let me just go to the smaller tracks, not knowing that the smaller tracks was suicide. I mean, it was impossible. So after, and then he died. So now I'm stuck with these horses that were, uh, that, that I, I had a, I had a race them, but they had no races for them because they were New York quality racing, uh, 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 racetracks that had, didn't have that quality. Oh, oh, they would have won too easily. So they couldn't really make races. For them. Well, they didn't write no race for them. I mean, I mean they were like $10,000 claimers and the highest race they wrote was the $2,000 claimer. So anyway, now a new track opens up, Lincoln Downs. First time they're going to do harness racing. It was always a thoroughbred track. And the purses would double what they were at all these other tracks. I apply for stalls and I get them. I'm sitting in the shed row one morning. I have a ho two horses in that night. And who comes walking down the shed row? Tony Shula and two of his friends. And he's and a big he, goon. Big, he was a big jerk. That's what he was. And he uh, he comes over to me and he says, you, he says, you, you, Larry Roller, here's Leon Bats right now. See this? Can you see that? Leon, no. Leon Bats. I don't know where it is. But anyway, Leon, I'll call you back. I'm on a, I'm on a call. So anyway, um, so he, he, uh, and that's how I met Tony Shula. And he says to me, he says, I'll give you, uh, you have two horses in both morning line favorites. <clears throat> And uh, he says, I'll give you 200 a horse. And uh, which was, uh, uh, I was penniless for two years. So I, I said to him, and I knew what he was doing. And I knew, I knew the game. He says, I'm, I'm with Whitey Bulger. We control all these racetracks around here. He says, if you're interested in making some money, I'm the guy to see. And I says, what do you have in mind? He says, you have two horses in, both more than line favorites. I'll give you 200 a horse. Just tell me what stall they're in. And uh, I'll have my vet take care of them. And I said to him, I said, uh, not trying to show any weakness. And in, in, in growing up with these kind of guys that try to impress you with their size and their bullshit. So I said, listen, I says, I have two morning line favorites. I said, uh, it's the first night of the meet. I says, I want 500 a horse and tell your vet to stay home. And then he said to me in the typical mob bullshit way, he says, you know who, to, you know what you're talking, you know who you're talking? I said, it makes no difference. I says, 500 a horse. And anyway, he winds up giving me the 500 and he says, I sure hope, he gave me a thousand dollars. He says, I sure hope you know what you're doing because I'll be back in the morning. And then I just said to him, I says, just bring coffee, uh, no sugar. And, and, and that's how the relationship started. And that's how our relationship started. And through that meet, um, we made a lot of money. And then with the Monticello meet that I started to tell you about with Charles Slutsky, when he did get in 71, uh, <clears throat> he shows up there. And I said, I says, what are you doing here? And he says to me, it's the only game in town. And, uh, and so I, I, we did what we did. And I, I was level with him and we made a lot of money. And then when the meet ended, he said to me, he says, um, uh, I says, you got to leave now because I didn't want him around. I didn't like him. I didn't like what he was doing. He makes threats to everybody. And I says, you got to leave now. And he says, oh, no, what about Roosevelt and Yonkers, which were the premier racetracks? And I says, uh, no, the, they, they got a crew there that handles them. And, and he says, well, he says, uh, you know, fuck, fuck them. And I says, no, there's no fuck them. They're with the Lucchese crew. They run Yonkers and Roosevelt. Forget about that. But I'm working on something. And that's when I got a hold of uh, uh, Manny Yukaza. Manny Yukaza was a jockey, a very famous Hall of Fame jockey that broke both his knees at Santa Anita Racetrack. And uh, 
uh, when, after his rehabilitation and everything, he couldn't ride no more, but he wanted to be with the horses. So Charles Slutsky, uh, the commission got a hold of Slutsky and they asked him if uh, he could put him, they could put him with a trainer. So they put him with me. I taught him how to ride, uh, how to drive harness horses, how to train. And I put him on a couple of horses right away. He won his first race and then they gave him a big write up. All of that is on my podcast, by the way. Uh, well, but and, and uh, um, and I asked him, I says, do you know Con Erico? Now, Con Erico was an old time jockey uh, from Panama and uh, they were all friends. And 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 um, so that's the guy who set up all the races for me with the New York jockeys. And I made Tony the, the middleman for that. And uh, and that's how we started fixing all the races at, Yon at, at Belmont and Aqueduct and Saratoga. And um, and we made we made hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then he start uh, instead of calling me once a day, he would call me one, uh, maybe two, three times a week. And then it came to once a week. And, and at this time, uh, I still had I, I still had the VIG payments I had to pay because it was. It was just 72, 73. And, uh, and that's when uh, a series of events happened where one of my runners got caught because I bought $100,000 worth of counterfeit money from uh, one of the Scarpo crews uh, in, in Philadelphia. Um, not um, and, Bruno? Bruno? Uh, no, uh, not Scarpo. Uh, who was that little guy that ran? Oh, Nicky Scarfo. Scarfo, yeah. He had a guy called Car Calamandre or something like that. One of the, one of his guys, and he was a he was a wheeler and deal. Anyway, he had a bunch of good counterfeit money, and I and I, I gave him ten thousand. He gave me a hundred thousand dollars worth of counterfeit bills, and I made these guys my runners use them sparingly at racetracks and and everything. Whenever I when we, we were betting. And uh, what happened was Charlie tried to buy a car with some counterfeit money. He got caught. He went to jail. When he went to jail, he was in the same jail in Indiana as, uh, as uh, um, uh, Frank Collada. And one day when I visited him, he introduced me to Frank. And I was a Chicago robber, hitman, worked with Tony Dan Spilatro, appears in Casino. Exactly. You're right. That's, that's the guy. And uh, he says, uh, Charlie told me about the problem you have. And he says, I think I'll be able to help you. So he says, I'll be out in another month or so. Here's my mother's phone number and uh, call me. And I did call him. And uh, and uh, he said, listen, uh, uh, I'm not supposed to do this, but I, um, I whatever whatever we do, we, I got to do with, with Tony. And uh, he's not going to meet you unless I'm with you. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm on paper. I'm on parole, but I, I'll fly out to California. And uh, so that's what we do. We flew out to California and I told Spilatro the whole story. And that worked out pretty good, too, because I believe that was the first year they opened up. Uh, the, I think it was the Stardust Hotel for uh, 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 sports betting and horse racing. <clears throat> and I told him what I could do. And uh, he was very excited about it. And he hooked me up with this monster uh uh, I forgot his name. That big, big guy. Big. Uh, I forgot his name. Blitz. Oh, Herbie Blitzstein. Herbie. Yeah, Blitzstein. yeah, yeah. Blitzstein. Yeah. And he had another guy with him, and uh, they flew back to New York with me, and they, they, we went looking for for Shula, and we found them, and uh, they, they just they, he, he put a gun right, right, almost through the roof of his mouth. And he says, we're going to stay here from now on. You're going to do the right thing. You're going to call Larry every day. And, uh, and, that, and that's what happened. And then we start making money. And we were, telling, we were calling Spilatro every day with the horses. He was making a ton of money down there. And, uh, and, and everything was going good. And they stayed for a couple of months. And when everything looked like it was going to be okay, uh, they left. And, and, and then he started his same nonsense again, not calling. And, uh, and, um, and that's when, when he stopped calling, that's the time when I met Nikki Barnes and them. So it always, you know, I always got lucky like that. Whenever something was going to end, I always got, I always got lucky like that. And he wind up getting caught 
And I never knew that anybody in the world knew this except me. But I watched one of your podcasts that you made six years ago, it said. And you did a podcast about the Detroit mob. And in that podcast, you had Fat Tony Shula. And that's where he went. Now, I found this out through a friend of mine who is Joe Zarelli's uh, his son, his, uh, Tony Zarelli's son, I guess. Who, who for a time in the late 70s was the boss of the Detroit family. And yeah. then he kind of got demoted and there's a whole big story. And before he died, you know, he was going on Detroit News saying he knew where Hoffa's body was buried and the FBI dug something up and he was trying to get money. And Yeah, yeah. His, his, his son was a really good guy. His Tony name was Joe Joe Zarelli, he was a veterinarian. He was my veterinarian. I met him. Oh, you knew Joe. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so you're not talking about Tony Zarelli. No, no, no. I'm talking about the Joe son. Junior. Junior, yeah. Ju Junior. In fact, I think I sent you a picture of him with, and I don't know if that was Joe Zarelli or Tony Zarelli, but that, that was his father. So whoever that was, his father and his brother in that picture. You see the picture I sent you? Yeah, let me look. Uh... Yeah, okay, so the guy the guy in the glass is the old guy. That's yeah. Tony Zarelli. Okay. So he was made the boss in the late 70s, and then they moved him back to underboss. So you're saying the guy next to him was your buddy? Yeah, that was the younger. Uh, that's okay. the veterinarian, yes. Okay, yeah. And right now he's practicing veterinarian uh, work. In, in oh, Dolphin. so the old guy's his dad. What's that? The old guy is your buddy's dad. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the the older guy was the son of Joe Uno Zarelli, one of the two founders of right. the Detroit Mafia. family. Yes. 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 So they were mafia royalty, and they actually owned. They had ownership in the in the the actual Detroit Mob owned the racetrack in, in Detroit. Yeah. In, in, fact, part, yeah. in fact, Joe, the veterinarian, asked me to try to sell that track for them. They wanted us. They were looking to sell it, but I, I had a couple of guys very interested, but it, it just got too, uh, they, um, back, they backed out for obvious reasons. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that was that. But that's where pin, that's where Fat Tony got pinched. I think they will, the, the FBI. Yeah, they did. They caught a case in, in Detroit. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So that's how he finally got, got, got pinched. So uh, that, that was the end of uh, Tony Shula. He was, not a, he was not a nice guy. He was. He, he was and he he beat up one of a uh, Jackie you worked with and almost killed him, right? Yes, and one of the guys he beat up uh, became a priest. Uh, in fact, I contacted him and he sent me his book. He wrote a book and became he became a priest or a pastor or something because like that because of getting beat up by Tony. Yeah, Cooper. yeah. He took oh, wow. he took he took the money and uh, he had no cho choice but he he ran over the money, meaning he finished in a position where he shouldn't have finished on purpose and, or by accident. And, and they, they beat him up really, really bad. And the same thing happened. And in, in when the last race, it, it Lincoln downs, he beat up a guy who ran over the money uh, in the last race we did. So I just packed up and I shipped out. And, uh, and I, I heard about three, four weeks later that he beat this guy really bad. A friend of mine that I made friends with up there, he called me up and he said, you know, uh, that the guy you're dealing with, Tony Shula, he beat this guy up really bad, and he's gonna, you know, he's gonna go to the commission and everything else. And I says, please tell him not to do that because he was he took money. He's gonna get himself involved. And I sent down five thousand for him, and I paid his hospital bills, and that and that thing was squashed. But when Tony showed up at Monticello, I told him about that, and I says, you can't be pulling that tough guy shit. You know, if somebody runs over the money, we make it up the next day. But uh, you, you can't be doing that. But that's how he was. And I think he was responsible for, for killing. Uh, I know. Well, I shouldn't say I know. There was a jockey that got killed. That I think his name was Amy that refused to take money. So and instead of, just, instead of letting it go, he just kept pursuing him and threatening him. And the guy wound up, one guy went to the commission and the other guy wound up dead now i don't know who how he wound up dead but anyway that, that could have been sure you wouldn't put it past shula 
No, I wouldn't put it past Shula. He he loved doing that. I mean, he he loved his 350 pounds going up against a 100-pound jockey and just slapping him around. And he bragged about it. Like, you know, it, it was he was just not a nice guy. In um, fact, when Whitey Bulger came to me at Lincoln Downs, because what Tony was doing, and I and I if I wasn't so desperate and I was a different kind of guy, I could have had I could have had Whitey just make Tony disappear back then because what he was doing, the first maybe two or three weeks, Tony Shula was betting with all the bookmakers in town, which were in fact Whitey Bulger's bookmakers. So Whitey comes to me one day with two or three guys. And uh, and he's the same thing. You, Larry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're dealing with Tony Shaw? Yeah, 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 yeah. And what happened was he found out because his bookmakers were getting busted out by Tony and going to Whitey for money. That Whitey would give him the money. You know, he charged them one point, all his bookmakers. And uh, and then he, he put it all together that, um, that uh, Tony was betting without saying anything to him. And uh, he straightened it out. He made Tony give him fifty thousand dollars that he just assumed that 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 would have been his end. And and uh, I could have probably put the the screws to him right then, but I, I I couldn't do it. I just knew that first of all I needed him. Second of all, uh, I, I I I wouldn't do it. But uh, he got what he he got what he deserved. He was just a bad guy. So um. Larry has a great book. I'm going to put the link. And then you have some TV movie stuff possibly cooking. I have, I have right now I have, this is like a preface to the TV series that's being written. Uh, oh, it is being written. Yeah. It's being written, but now it's on hold because of the writer's strike. <laughs> but I have right now, every Tuesday, another, another episode comes. I have seven podcasts out there right now. Uh, talking about my whole life, what I did, how I did it, including the whole Nicky Bonds thing. Uh, and all they have to do is go on YouTube and uh, punch I'll in. Put, I'll put a link to it. Yeah, Larry Roller, and, and that's it. And, and, and they'll, they'll get right to it. And uh, anytime you need me for anything, I, I have to say this. Uh, I've been, ever since I got involved with this podcast thing, I, wa I watch a lot of them, and then I got a call from you, and I saw looking back at you. I don't know how the hell you do what you do. All the, all the, the, the investigative work you must do, all the, the preparation, and, and from what I understand, you put it all together wow. yourself, you narrate it yourself, you, it's it's like amazing and then i look and they're, they're they're like one day apart two days apart last month last week i i don't i don't understand how, how you do it well it's a, it's a passion just you know and uh uh you know i came out of graduate school i got a master's in economics so i was used to doing research and numbers and stuff so it it all came together for me and i i like doing it because it's a i'm more into like the history and the sociology of it and the crime is like an interesting way to get into talking about, you know, what's going on with people in America and, and stuff, you know. How come you never got into making, like, making movies and stuff like that? I've made a, I made an independent movie, Goes to St. Auburn. I had it in Netflix. Uh, uh, money is in YouTube right now. Movies, like, you know, look how long of a process. I mean, I got movie stuff, TV stuff cooking. It just... The industry is is weird, but I made my own independent movie before, like a fiction movie that I got distributed in Redbox and all that. And I'm gonna. And what's 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 what amazes me is that you you talk about each each situation like you like that's all you did your whole life. It's 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 unbelievable. I sit in there in amazement, and it's not only a twenty minute thing. Some of them are, but some of them go on for an hour and a half. Oh, yeah, the Detroit Mob one I did with my partner, Scott Bernstein. He helped with the research. Yeah, that's an hour and a half. And, uh, yeah, I love history. I love looking at old photos and videos. And uh, you, know, you, know what I would, you know what I would like? And I don't know how to do this. But being at the writer's strike, now I hear that now the actors are going on with them and everything. And, and the, team, the Teamsters. Yeah, the team. This thing might last for forever. Who knows? But uh, what, I, what I would like, and I don't know how to go about it, is I would like to, 
because I, I noticed that on, on all these podcasts, all these now they're all these mob informants. They're all yeah, yeah, right. And they go on each other's thing, and they all promote one another. I'm trying to, even though my thing is probably different, but I would like to get on one of them shows to try to boost because I got no way of letting anybody know about my podcast, even though they get four or five thousand four or five thousand views. It adds up, yeah. You know, I, I guess it adds up, but if you could, I know that's because I, I when I saw the video that you did eight years ago and six years, Scott Scott whatever his name was was your partner on that. Yeah, he knows and everybody. Yeah, that's he, my guy. Had, yeah. So if there's any way that you could put me in touch with him and maybe he could get me on one of the shows that would, you know, I, I'll give, I'll give, I'll call him uh, when we get off right now. Yeah. That's my, that's my guy. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he knows everybody and he's from what I understand, he's very well respected and he was oh, one, yeah. of the, one of the first ones. And maybe he could say, yeah, this guy would be the perfect guy that would interview you and, and, and help you. Cause I guess that's the only way I can get more, more, more people. I, I yeah, guess that'll, that'll, that'll help. Is, yeah, that'll help you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna text Scott right now. And as long as the writer's strike is gonna go on forever, uh, I might as well. Yeah, I might yeah. as well do this and try to make it work. Yeah, yeah, I'm texting him right now. Okay, Larry, thank you for the awesome interview, and I'm sure we'll do another one soon. If you need me for anything, just call me. You're a hell of a guy, and thank, thank you, you very much. Super interesting, nice guy, Larry Roller. Link to his book and a link to his existing podcast are in the description. Al Profit American Dope, Larry Roller. Thank you, Al. Bye. See ya.